You guys know how we always joke on the internet about how Phil Collins didn't have to go so hard on the soundtrack for Tarzan. Well, DreamWorks Studios told Phil, hold my glass of milk, because we're about to make a kid's movie that doesn't just go ham, it goes full delicatessen, baby. Nobody expected a film with deep philosophical questions about death and what it reveals about what we value as people. Yeah, this is a kid's movie that asks you, have you considered your own mortality lately? Well, that got dark. Somebody at DreamWorks has been reading stoic stuff. Get yourself one of these books, kids. Epictetus will change your fucking life. Mind you, we're talking about Puss in Boots, which is a sequel to a movie from 10 years ago, which itself was a movie based on a side character from a sequel to Shrek. I am your father's brother's nephew's cousin's former roommate. What's that make us? Absolutely nothing. Before we go any further, I'm not making this video just to tell you what a gem Puss in Boots 2 is. Even though I, I don't actually need more reason, it's that good of a movie. My main point is that this movie has strong human themes that make it so good. Look, we all had fun dunking on Velma because it was just so damn shallow. There was no human theme or story. It was just, ha ha, audience stupid, and ha ha, rich white man bad, he have small peen. Puss in Boots, The Last wish uses every character, every scene to illustrate its main point. You have to be grateful for your life and value what's already right in front of you and stop chasing fantasies. That is a message that can speak to literally every one of us. I'm going to start by talking about anything other than Goldilocks and the bears because I will be crying when I speak about that part. I'm feeling... So the movie opens up Puss is a folk hero. He even sings a song about it. He's giving a finger to the rich people. He's throwing money to the common man. He's defeating monsters. And then suddenly, he dies. We get a funny montage showing how he's died eight times, so he's on his last of nine lives, but he refuses the doctor's advice to retire because he cannot let go of his folk hero persona. He doesn't even have regard for his own life because he needs the validation of the crowd. This is when we get the first of two villains in this movie in the form of a rather scary wolf that shows up to challenge Puss. Puss thinks he's a bounty hunter, but him showing up suddenly, the black hood, the scythes, the line he gives about everybody thinks they're gonna be the one to escape me gives us a pretty strong hint that this is the Grim Reaper, which we find out later he is. Puss is not appreciating his lives and death has come to claim the last one. They have a pretty cool fight. He draws blood and it makes Puss see his own mortality for the first time. He has a full on panic attack and runs away. Marvel writers probably stay up at night wishing they could write a villain like this. DreamWorks is bringing up the inevitability of our own death to drive their point home in this movie. Tahid, how hard are they going here? So hard and make the metal detector go off. That's pretty hard. He then runs off to a crazy cat lady retirement home where we see him slowly drift off into madness because his entire sense of self was wrapped up in the external validation he got from his fans. Being top C amounted to absolutely nothing in the end. Hmm. Now we get some quick character intros. Pero is a dog living under the porch of the crazy cat house. He's dressed as a cat. He wants to be friends with Puss and he dreams of being a therapy dog one day. Goldilocks and the three bears are actually a cockneyed crime family and they're planning on stealing a magical map that leads to the wishing star. They're gonna steal that map from Jack Horner, our second villain. He has a pie empire and he's using his vast wealth to accumulate magical fairy tale items. Finally, Kitty Softpaws is back and she too is trying to steal the map. Along the way to the Wishing Star, this is when we really get the character development and the reinforcement of this theme. Jack Horner is hilariously evil and unredeemable. You're not gonna shoot a puppy, are you, Jack? Yeah, in the face, why? He values things and money and more stuff so much that he has lost respect for human life and he ends up sacrificing most of his team on the route to the star. We find out that Puss and Kitty were going to get married before Puss got scared of settling down and left her at the altar. Except she didn't show up either because she didn't want to compete with his love of himself. Take note, gentlemen. The two of them have led empty lives to this point because they're always chasing more adventure and treasure, which we know can be stolen by thieves and eaten by moths. Pero has the absolute darkest backstory. We find out the sweater he is wearing is made from the bag he was tied in and thrown in a river. Jesus. 
he's almost insane with his optimism. And he's like, yeah, it was a rough day, but look, I got this great sweater. Despite all of this, he still values serving other people and he really wants to be a therapy dog. Okay, here's waterwork spot number one. Goldilocks is revealed to be after the star because she actually wants to wish for a real family. And the bears are shocked at this point because they think they already are a family. And then you have this scene where the mama bear tells her, you know what, if it's if it's that important to you, we love you and we're gonna make this happen for you if that's what you need. And whether you think we're your family or not, if this is something that will make you happy, we'll get you that wish. Holy shit, DreamWorks. Get back in there, Tia. We also see Death slowly stalking Puss, and a lot of the plot is driven by him literally running away in fear. Now, I've never had like a panic or anxiety attack, but the portrayal in this movie makes it look god awful. Tear spot number two, in one scene, Puss is freaking out so badly, it looks like he's gonna have an actual heart attack, and Pero finds him and lays down on his leg to help him calm down and be his therapy dog. Bobby. If you're watching this movie, and by these two points you haven't felt a little bit of pressure in the gills, maybe you're a sociopath. These characters all exist on this spectrum of gratitude, and the film illustrates its theme by the reactions that each group has. In the middle, you've got Goldilocks and the bears. In the end, when she's about to make her wish, she sees that she already has a family, and she saves Baby Bear from dying, giving up her chance at the wish in the process. After all the action goes down, she tells them, I didn't need it because I already have my wish. <sighs> oh, get past the bears, get past the fucking bears. Fun personal fact about Greg time, I have a foster child. This scene with Goldilocks and the bears, I was fucking crying in that theater, okay? You go right ahead, dude. Okay, oh shit. We have a big showdown. Puss chooses to fight death. He doesn't give up. He wants to truly live his last life. He sees Kitty and Pero and he realizes he really has been missing out on what is truly important. When Death sees that he's truly valuing the life that he has, he walks away. Jack Horner is our negative example. He is unrepentantly pure evil and even Jiminy Cricket gives up on him. You're horrible. You're an irredeemable monster. At the end, his greed and his need for more, more, more leads to his own death. Pero is on the other side of the spectrum. He's had it right all along. He has always known he wants to serve other people as a therapy dog. He has been supporting his friends no matter what. Go home. Well, my home is where my friends are. Despite his horrifying backstory, he is cherishing every day and he knows what really matters. What's really impressive is that all of these themes are wrapped up in a fun, well-animated package. Seriously, the animation has to be mentioned here. They obviously took cues from Spider-Verse and there's a lot of times where they're playing with the frame rate to add style. The wolf looks like he's made of watercolor sometimes. It's very stylish and extremely visually pleasing. It's also fun. You would think that all of these dark and heavy themes would weigh the film down. Somehow, Pero describing his own attempted murder Horner killing people and letting people die, literal death stalking Puss in Boots. All of it is played for laughs and it works somehow. I was in the theater with kids ranging from three to 14. Nobody was distressed, nobody was upset, they were having a great time. Somehow they got these complex themes into a fun, easy to watch kids movie. Really impressive when you stand back and look at it. This is the kind of message we want in movies. This is what resonates with our humanity and emotion. Man overcoming vice, good triumphing over evil, philosophical questions that make us reflect on ourselves. This is why She-Hulk didn't work and Civil War did. Civil War asks interesting questions about the nature of justice and which means are worth a certain end. It wants to know what you would do with the trolley problem. Jen Walters told us that being single isn't great and men generally suck. Cool. If you haven't seen Puss in Boots 2 or contemplated your own inevitable death lately, both are well worth your time. Thanks for watching. See you next time.